Technology progresses so fast. Less than 50 years after its invention, 35% of US housing units had telephones. Approximately 20 years after penicillin's accidental discovery, it could be found in most pharmacies. And just eight years after the Wright brothers first took flight, the first plane for military use was put in action. As we are able to create more, more quickly, realizing our ambitions faster than ever before, there was a question I wanted to pose. Why were we never able to get nuclear-powered planes? We have nuclear submarines and aircraft carriers. There have even been ideas for nuclear-powered cars. But what went wrong with the development of nuclear aircraft? What happened to the Aircraft Nuclear Propulsion Program? This is the third episode in my ongoing series about the Atoms for Peace movement. We've already covered nuclear excavation and the attempt to nuke the moon, which I will link to at the end of the video. So fasten your seatbelts and put your seats in the upright position as we learn something new. In order to understand some of the benefits that nuclear power has provided for travel, let's look at the closest successful example, the nuclear-powered submarine. Way before nuclear power was added to the underwater submersibles, they used good old-fashioned muscle. After that, when the technology became more feasible, they used diesel engines. Because of this, they had to frequently go into port to refuel and found themselves constantly surfacing, negating some of the prime benefits submarines provided. So when nuclear technology was being thoroughly researched, the idea of adding it to submarines was near the top of the list of things to look into. Which brings us to September 30th, 1954, when the USS Nautilus, the world's first nuclear submarine, was commissioned by the Navy. It ended up being a godsend for the Navy, going on to break many records, including the fastest speed for a submarine, with its nuclear reactor allowing it to break 20 knots, as well as being the first submarine to go under the entire geographic North Pole. The upgrades also led to further advancements, being able to use all the extra power for things like reverse osmosis for getting clean water from salt water to use for drinking, and electrolysis to turn seawater into breathable air. With the submarine now able to go decades without needing to be refueled, they were only limited by the crew's endurance, staying in cramped quarters for months on end, and their food supplies. With all of these benefits, it's not a stretch that officials would want to try and replicate it for the skies, albeit for slightly different reasons. The Italian-American physicist Enrico Fermi, yes, the same Fermi that proposed the Fermi paradox, had introduced the idea of nuclear flight as early as 1942, while serving on the Manhattan Project to build the first atomic bomb. As World War II drew to a close, the United States began to realize Fermi's dream of nuclear-powered flight. At least, they wanted to. From 1946 until 1961, vast teams of engineers, strategists, and administrators toiled in an attempt to get the idea off the ground. The advantages of nuclear-powered airplanes would mirror those of nuclear submarines. Nuclear subs didn't need to surface for fuel, and nuclear airplanes would not need to land. A 1945 proposal from the Department of War, now known as the Department of Defense, promised, with nuclear propulsion, supersonic flight around the world becomes an immediate possibility. A secret Atomic Energy Commission memorandum, now held in the Eisenhower Presidential Library, explained the premise. Nuclear energy should make possible ranges of one or more times around the world with a single loading of the reactor. The idea of a nuclear-powered bomber became a strategic dream for the military. It could stay aloft for days to cover any number of targets throughout the world before returning to the United States without ever needing to refuel. The problem of refueling airplanes would go on to occupy the minds of many in the Cold War. Bombers would often strain to reach their targets, and some would strand in enemy territory with too little fuel to return home if they flew on only a single tank. Aerial refueling offered a solution, but a poor one. Planes caught in the act over enemy territory were prone to anti-aircraft fire. Evasive maneuvers would uncouple the two planes, prevent successful refueling, and endanger the mission. To minimize the need for dangerous refueling, the United States relied on a global network of Air Force bases. Such bases, usually close to the USSR, allowed planes to reach their targets and return on a single tank of fuel. Procuring the bases, however, proved expensive and unpopular. At one point, the United States offered $100 million in gold to purchase Greenland from Denmark and gain a new strategic location for bases. In the end, Denmark decided to keep Greenland, but the proposal illustrates the lengths the United States had to go to to compensate for its plane's limited range. A nuclear-powered plane could avoid all of these issues. 
But nuclear power came with its own problems. The reactor would have to be small enough to fit onto an aircraft, which meant it would release far more heat than a standard one, which meant it could risk melting the reactor and the plane, sending radioactive chunks of liquid metal into whatever was unlucky enough to be below it. Not exactly ideal. There was also the problem of shielding pilots from the reactor's radiation, which proved even more difficult. What good is a plane that can kill or seriously harm its own pilots? To protect the crew, the reactor needed thick and heavy layers of shielding. But planes, in general, need to be as light as possible to even take off. It seemed at the time that adequate shielding just did not work with flight. Even when engineers considered that the weight saved from not having any jet fuel would make the aircraft lighter. The U.S. spent 16 years trying to make it work, but ultimately failed. The USSR also pursued nuclear aircraft technology, but ended up running into similar issues. Unfortunately for atomic flight enthusiasts, both countries had little to brag about. Neither program managed to overcome the problems of shielding and weight. The development of the intercontinental ballistic missile in the 1950s, moreover, weakened the case for developing nuclear-powered bombers. The nuclear airplane became redundant from a military point of view, as ICBMs avoided the problems of manned nuclear flight. They had only one-way missions, needed no refueling, and did not have pilots that needed to be shielded. Without a military justification for atomic flight, funding withered away. The nuclear airplane began to die a slow death. In the late 1950s, the Eisenhower administration cut the program's budget. Nikita Khrushchev would go on to slash the funding for the Soviet equivalent. Atomic flight seemed doomed, but not everyone was so inclined to give up just yet. In a last-ditch effort to keep the nuclear airplane program on the table, military strategists considered a radical solution. They could use pilots closer to death. The Air Force would use crews old enough to die of natural causes before the harmful effects of radiation could show up and thus sidestep the shielding problem. As the nuclear policy expert Leonard Weiss explained in an article for the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, the proposal would have made radiation shielding unnecessary and decreased the weight of the plane significantly. It might have let the nuclear airplane take to the skies. This idea of a tour of irradiated elderly pilots patrolling the world's skies ready to unleash nuclear catastrophe drew on a form of ageism that pervaded Cold War apocalypse planning. In civil defense plans for surviving a nuclear apocalypse, the old were always sacrificed first. A man by the name of Herman Kahn made a ranking of food uses after a nuclear catastrophe that reflected this Cold War age bias. The scale ranged from grade A, high quality food reserved for pregnant women, to grade E, radioactive food only good for feeding animals. People over the age of 50 composed group D. Khan went on to put it bluntly in his book On Thermonuclear War. Most of these people would die of other causes before they got cancer from the radiation. Eventually, one nuclear plane capable of takeoff would be created. The NB-36 Crusader was the last hope for the plane. With a lead-lined cockpit protecting the pilots and onboard nuclear engineers, the plane managed to take flight and land safely. 47 times. It would spend a total of 215 hours in the sky, 89 of which was done using the nuclear reactor for power. Nuclear flight was possible. It could be done, but in the end, it wasn't enough. The Eisenhower administration concluded that the program was unnecessary, dangerous, and too expensive. On March 28, 1961, the newly inaugurated President John F. Kennedy canceled the program. Proposals for nuclear-powered airplanes have popped up since then, but the fear of radiation and the lack of funding have all kept such ideas down. So you may be wondering, how does this factor into the Atoms for Peace movement? After all, I haven't exactly been talking about civilian applications. Understand that while I'm talking about these in military use for this episode, the Atoms for Peace movement was indeed intended to enhance the United States as a nuclear power under the guise of peace. Many of these technologies that were being explored at the time were in fact also being pitched as potentials for civilian use in the future. Take for example the 1959 Ford Nucleon. It was never truly planned as a legitimate vehicle, but it operated as a way for people to get excited about the concept of nuclear technology and back their government as they accrued more and more uranium. 
The concept for the car said that it could theoretically run for more than 5,000 miles without needing to refuel. To accommodate the most compact version of a nuclear reactor, it would have needed to be over 16 feet long, 6.5 feet wide, and at least 3.5 feet off the ground. Ford stated that a power capsule would sit in the trunk of the Nucleon and would generate power to move the car via electronic torque converters. Think about it though. If you were skeptical of nuclear power being used in everything, but found out it could make it so that you only have to get gas every six months, would that make you more open to the idea? Thank you for watching Learn Something New. I want to give a big thanks to all the new subscribers, all of the people that have been liking my videos and going through my catalog, and to you, watching this video right now. You've made it to the end, and I hope you feel more knowledgeable for it. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next one!